sacramental abuse, but it's not the only abuse that we must bring light to. There's also discussion on the sexual abuse among children, especially those with disabilities. Despite the UN conventions and Uganda national laws and policies on rights of people with disabilities, implementation and enforcement of most of these recommended interventions remains glued on paper. And you get to see so many of things coming up affecting people with disabilities and that causes their plight to grow in silence such as child sexual exploitation and abuse and this can hinder the country's set targets for the sustainable development goals of 4, 8, 10, 11 and 17 as well as Uganda's vision 2040. So we are here to discuss this issue of sexual e exploitation and also abuse to those that are with disabilities especially with the children and I, I am joined by Carol Bankusha who's the consultant Uganda Child's Rights NGO Network. Good morning to you Carol. Good morning my dear and good morning to our viewers. I hope that you are all well. Okay, yeah. well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I would like you to share with our audience some of the statistics when it comes to sexual abuse and exploitation of children, especially with those with disabilities. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for starters, according to Uganda Bureau of Statistics, we have a population of about staggering 12.5% of persons with disability in the country, but also a Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development analysis of uh, 2022 also highlights that we have about 8.5% of the population, people with disability. Now, when it comes to children, uh, because Uganda comprises of a younger population, we have about half of that being children with disability. And uh, sadly so, uh, half of about 8.5 or 12.5 is a very big population of children with disability. Now, in this study, we realized that uh, out of every 10 children that have a disability, about six are being sexually violated within their homes, within their homesteads, within their family environment mostly. And that is a very worrying situation. Uh, why? Because uh, there is this negative attitude from the, the parents, the guardians, the caregivers. Uh, some of them are saying they are so much constrained with the burden of caring for these children. And so, I mean, they have to go out there and fend for, for a living and do other things. And so they tend to neglect them. Uh, in, this, in this way, the children are left in the backyards, they are left in the gardens, they are left on their own uh, within the, the homestead for days on their own. And so very worrying is that they might not eat, they might not uh, wash, they might not drink, depending on their disability, because we are talking physical disability, uh, uh, intellectual disability, where a child cannot even talk, does not even comprehend who you are, does not understand the environment. Then we are talking about hearing impairments and speech impairments. Impairment. So uh, perpetrators take advantage of this situation and then prey on their children and sexually violate them. Okay, all right. Mm. So you have uh, mentioned enabling circumstances that are home-centered more or less. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about enabling circumstances uh, within the community, leadership, and uh, maybe government for that matter. Um, um, you know that uh, care and protection of children begins within the family system. And so if the family doesn't care for the child or doesn't bring out the voice about what the child is experiencing, especially in the negative way, then the surrounding community might also not get to know what it is that the child is going through. And uh, uh, communities have not proactively gone out to find, find out even the numbers of children with disability in their own communities. Sometimes the easiest uh, example is communities, community leaders, religious leaders in a community will not even go ahead to find out how many children do not go to school, you know. So when it comes to children with disability because of the hidden nature, then the, the communities are also not very responsive. Mm -hmm. They are not responsive. And if they are not, then the, the duty bearers, the, the actors in both government and civil society might not even know what is happening 
happening to such children. So this study, this research is an eye-opener for us all to get to know what is it that actually the children with disability are facing in terms of deprivation but also in terms of sexual violations. Uh, sadly, uh, when we were conducting this uh, study, the voices concerning the boy children didn't come out, and so that is a disclaimer uh, on behalf of the respondents, of course, uh, because this is a hidden vice. It is very, very hidden. So voices concerning the girl child are the ones that came out strongly, but I do have a belief that even the boy child is being violated. And I definitely do share yeah. that belief with mm -hmm. you, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, over time we've gotten to see that even the boy child uh, mm -hmm. gets to suffer sexual harm, abuse, or exploitation for that matter. Yes. Uh, but away from that, let's let's look at the challenges that have actually enabled this vice to increase more and more, especially in Uganda. Um, I'll, I'll have three pointers, and the very first one is that children with disability are rarely enrolled in school. Uh, there is a, re a study that shows that while 8% no, 9% of the children with disability were enrolled in school. The other percentage was at 90 for the normal able-bodied children. 90% had been enrolled in school, and that is a very, very big variation. Okay, then when it comes to completion of primary, getting on to secondary school, it's only 6% of the children with disability, children that had been enrolled, only 6% were able to get to the next level. And while you have about 70% uh, of the able-bodied children being able to enroll to continue to the secondary level education. So the issue is enrollment of children with a disability. That is one. Number two, even if a caring parent would like to enroll their child, special child, in, in a school, the schools are not receptive. They also have reasons, and in this study we found out that the, the capitation grant that they receive from the Ministry of Education, from the central government, is not adequate for them to have well-trained teachers to attend to the needs of these children, to have the equipment that they will use for these children. For example, like I said, some of the children cannot see, and so they will need braille machine, they will need uh, the kind of paper that they use is not this other paper that uh, a normal child will use so uh, the facilities in the school are not there the, 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 the staffing in the schools are not are not trained you know to attend to this school and this points sorry to attend to the child and this points out to the there is a policy a well-meaning policy on inclusive education and so that means that even a child with special needs a child with disability will enroll in the other normal schools and that is really good it is good so as to avoid stigma uh, discrimination however even if the parent would like to enroll, what other facilities in these schools? Okay, um, yeah. Carol, you say that it would, you know, boost the child with a disability to join school mm. and, uh, you know, take away the stigma of their situation. Yeah. But then, in a school setting where you do have 90% abled children, mm. if this um, percentage actually gets to be enrolled in such an environment, mm. how do you then control the 90% helping? understanding the plight of this 10% that is disabled so that they don't bully them, uh, they, they don't mm. bruise them in one mm. way or another, mm. or they don't make their livelihood difficult to receive the education as fair as they are receiving it. The, the trained and professional teachers know that very well, that uh, uh, even when you receive this child with disability in your classroom setting, the, the, the setting in the classroom becomes different. You're able to give priority to these other children. You even educate or, or uh, bring to the attention of the other children about the plight of this child or these two, three children in this classroom. And it actually works. It really works wonders. So uh, or from the onset the teacher is able to tell these other children about how we have a brother and
and a sister who is here to learn. And so please, you help out whenever uh, there is need. For example, if the child is using a wheelchair, the teacher will be able to assign particular children that will be able to help out this child while on the wheelchair. And so it actually reduces the stigma. It reduces the discrimina discrimination. So uh, the, the thinking, the, the thinking in that policy, which I also agree to, is that this, the, the children should not be taken to special schools, especially depending as well on the, on the nature of disability. They can be included in these other schools so that they also develop alongside with the other children. Okay, mm. all right. So mm. you have mentioned that the inability for them to receive education is one of the reasons as to yes. why we're having sexual abuse against yes. uh, children with disabilities on an increase. Let's look at the social development goal uh, four that calls for quality education uh, to all. How then do you merge this uh, development goal to be able to attend to this special group and then as you are saying, mm. have them receive the holistic education everyone else is receiving uh, without necessarily considering special education for them? Um, I, I would like to do a rejoinder that once a child is enrolled in school, then the chances of them being violated, because most of the time is spent at home, are much, much less. We take and we do believe, even we would even see during the, the COVID lockdowns, that actually a school is a safer place for a child other than the home. Of course, there could be little issues out there in the schools, but we still consider schools as being safe spaces for all our children. And yeah. now, if these children are not enrolled in school, if we don't equip the schools with teachers specially trained to handle them, with equipment, with resources to help these our children enroll, be retained, and complete their education, then we are actually promoting inequality. We are very much promoting inequality, and yet we need to bridge that gap in accordance with the uh, sustainable development goals. The other thing, we shall seem to be, as a country, we shall seem to be discriminatory. We, we uphold the other normal children to go to school because they can easily move to the schools, and then these ones are left behind. The global agenda today is that no one should be left, left behind. behind. And yeah. when it comes to children, no children should be left behind. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so in regards to the other SDGs that could be affected, decent work and economic growth, you do have reduced, re reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, and also partnerships for the goals. How then do we create an environment that encompasses all? Education for these children, attention to the children, provision of basic needs, ensuring that the children are cared for and protected and nurtured very well is something that will promote all the other goals for this child and for the country at large. Decent work. Once the child is educated, trained, skilled, uh, regardless of their disability. We have seen uh, adults that of course were children before that have perfected. Uh, recently we were told uh, of uh, the very first magistrate in Uganda who is visually impaired, but of course it's taken us very many years to have a first magistrate of that nature. So. If we put in a little bit more effort, not just a little, actually a lot of effort in ensuring that our children are educated, they are trained, they are cared for, at the end of it all they will be subjected, they will be exposed to decent work, paying work, they will be able to nurture their own families, they will be able to take care of themselves, and at the end of it all we shall have growth as a country. Okay, yes. all right. So how is Uganda Child's Rights NGO Network, uh, you know, doing? What are they doing to mitigate this issue? Uh, Uganda Child Rights NGO Network is, is a network of various other organizations, but of course very child focused, child rights focused. And one of them is this. We carried out this study in, uh, in two districts of the country, and uh, we are saying yes, we can still continue, we shall continue to carry further studies, to carry out further studies for the, the other districts, the other areas in the regions. Um, this is one of the things, bringing out the voice out there to the people. 
is very, very important. But also sharing these very findings with stakeholders is also one thing. Sharing these findings with organizations that are part of the network that are focused on disability among children. You know, and if that is done, at the end of it all, we shall have justice for the children. Okay. It is one way of bringing out the voice, ensuring that actually even the structures in the child protection path are able to respond to the calls of the children. One thing I didn't talk about, reporting is very, very low. Many of these children have been violated and there is no reporting at all. We interviewed district actors, we interviewed the police, in the districts. We interviewed probation and social welfare officers, uh, community development officers, and for some of them they have never interfaced with a, a, a case, a matter that has been brought to their attention about a child being violated, especially one with disability. So uh, in this regard, we are having a campaign. And this, these results, we named them Double Pain, Disability and Abuse. So as Uganda Child Rights NGO Network, we are going to carry out a campaign just to ensure that first of all, the child is protected, but also that the reporting mechanism is, it is distributed out to all the partners, to all the actors, such that even a police officer who is at their desk is able to understand the plight of this child. Okay, all mm -hmm. right. Civil society is doing their due diligence we commend yeah. them for that. Yeah. Uh, but government also ought to do their diligence because you're here to help government yes. achieve these SDGs. So mm -hmm. what is government currently doing about the, the plight of the disabled child? I may not be a spokesperson for government, but yes, uh, having shared with them this report at the, at the inauguration, at the inception, they, they already showed steps. In, in, in doing something and doing a lot about this area because, for example, the Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development is all out to ensure that all the vulnerable groups are protected and that they are promoted in their own way, especially at family, community level, but also at institutional level. Uh, this report having shared it with them and also continuously sharing. For example, the other gov arm of government, which is the Uganda Parliamentary Forum for Children, mm -hmm. right? We shall continue sharing it with them and I'm sure that they will listen to these voices. They will listen to these voices. And one thing that probably we also would like central government through the Ministry of Finance is to allocate more financial resources to the, the, the relevant ministries so that at the end of it all it is that child with a special need that benefits from this all. Okay, mm. all right. Now, Caro, you, of course, the NGO network is mm. helping a lot, which yeah. requires money. And mm. I know that you've been getting funds uh, from different partners yes. and so forth. Yes. However, most recently, you saw government putting a limit to foreign funding to NGOs. How has this affected the work that you were doing? Uh, luckily enough uh, for us at Uganda Child Rights NGO Network, we were not uh, uh, largely affected by that by that cut because uh, UCRNN had not been uh, uh, funded by that facility by that facility. Currently, we are receiving financial support from USAID Freedom House, and we shall continue to 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 request for more resources, such that at the end of it all, like I always say it is the child that benefits, but also bringing out the voices of the children that are being affected. Largely we were not affected, but we also continue to work very, very closely with the government arms, especially through the Mother Ministry of Gender, but also we, we plan to gain entry into the Ministry of Education. Uh, we are already in good books with the Ministry of Internal Affairs, sharing reports and all that. And uh, we are a law-abiding uh, network who would like to continue uh, responding to their calls of government. All right, uh, mm. Carol, in your closing marks, how else can the community uh, be advised on creating an enabling environment for children with disabilities to thrive alongside the rest of society? Um, I'm, I'm thinking the issue of numbers has not come up very well. Uh, in your own community where you reside, in my own community where I reside, even as a child rights advocate, I've seen children with disability, but Probably, sadly, I haven't taken it upon myself to see that I, I get to know through the local leadership how many children 
uh, have disability in this community. Mm -hmm. So that is something that community leadership, from right from the village le level, uh, sub-county, districts, have to, to start with how many children with disability do you have in your in your communities in your jurisdiction and what type of disabilities and of these how many of them are able to access the basic social services how many i'm talking about education because that was a focus for this study but next time probably i'll come back here to talk about health okay. how do they how are they able to access health services with many of children with disability having high medical needs you know so let's focus our attention to the child at the grassroots right. but also look at the child with disability and in that way we shall make sure that our children are not sexually violated. Well that is Carol Bankusha who is a consultant with Uganda Child Rights NGO Network and she's given you a very simple task. Do you know the number of children with disabilities in